This is part four of our series on the Eucharist training, and we're going to conclude with Eucharist training tonight. We spent parts one, two, and three going over all the scriptures about Eucharist, going over all of the, the early church fathers and what they said, and we went through all the details, and, and why do we do what we do, and how do we do it, and, and just went through a lot of background on the Eucharist. And so now we're going to put all that together in a practicum where I'm going to do an illustrated Eucharist. We're going to do just the Eucharist part of a church service, and I'm going to spend a lot of time giving you scriptural references for each part, and I'm going to explain what I'm doing, or try to anyway, explain the different uh, things that we have on the altar, etc. And so it's just going to be kind of a chance to see, for you to see, what I'm thinking uh, when, when I do Eucharist, what has gone behind some of the things we do in Eucharist and why we do them. We also have, like we did the last three times, we have a WebEx going on at the same time. There are folks from our church on the WebEx, and when I look that way, I'm looking at the WebEx talking to them. It's set up so that if they have a question or they have a comment, you should be able to hear on the YouTube video whatever they've got to say. So we'll see how this works tonight. We are going to be celebrating... Eucharist. This is not just a show. This is an illustrated Eucharist. And we're going to start on page 360 of the Book of Common Prayer, the 1979 Book of Common Prayer. If you have something like that, get it available. If you don't have something like that, you might want to look online. There are several sites that have the Book of Common Prayer in PDF form, in web form, uh, where you can find, and, and if it's the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, and I say go to page 359, we'll all be looking at exactly the same thing. And so, when we start the Eucharist, really the very First thing, we have finished the sermons, we've finished uh, uh, all the, the music and the worship and that sort of thing of the service. And so now it's time to move into the Holy Communion. As far as I'm concerned, that really starts with us preparing our hearts. You know, Jesus told us uh, when he was giving us the Lord's Prayer... In the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But then afterwards, there in Matthew 6, he's, he makes sure that we understood that part. And he said, because if you do not forgive, your heavenly Father will not or cannot forgive you. And so we're going to start with a prayer that's not in the prayer book. And that's a prayer that I'm going to pray over us. You pray it along in your heart with me to make sure that there's no unforgiveness in our hearts of any kind. So, Father, I just ask you to send your Holy Spirit into each of our hearts now. Send that searchlight of the Holy Spirit, that function of the Holy Spirit that shows us things, that reveals things to us. Send Him into our hearts to reveal to us any place where we're holding on to any grudges or bitterness or unforgiveness or anger. Show us those places now, Lord. And prick our hearts. Touch us so that we won't want to hold on to those things, but we'll want to let go of those. Show us how to forgive. If you have a Bible, you want to join, turn with me. Before we pray a prayer of forgiveness, I want to read a scripture out of 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9. 1 John 1, verse 8, John says, If we say that we have no sin, he's talking to Christians now, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. At the top of 359 is a great prayer for forgiveness. Let's pray that together. I mean page 360, I'm sorry. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Now listen to this declaration after that. And you'll notice that I'm not forgiving you. There are some communions that believe that people can only receive forgiveness through a priest or a bishop or an archbishop. We don't believe that. We believe we receive forgiveness directly from God. And we ask for forgiveness, He gives it to us. All I'm doing is confirming what God does. And you'll notice, I want you to read along the acclamation in the prayer book. You'll notice I do it just a little bit differently. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wash you in the blood of Jesus. Strengthen you in all goodness. And let you know that you have been washed by the blood of Jesus and you're now innocent and clean. Amen. As I did that, I made the sign of the cross over you. That is one of the most ancient symbols of the church and it represents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you'll see that I do that at different times uh, during the service, during the liturgy. Now, at this point, in a service is what's called passing the peace. Uh, since we're not in a congregation right now, we're not going to do that. But the idea is, remember where Jesus said, if when you're making your offering, you remember that someone has something against you, he said, leave your offering at the altar and go and make amends with them, restore your relationship with them, do that right away. The sharing of the peace in a Christian service is all about making sure that we have nothing against anybody in the service. Now, for most of us, <laughs> that's not an issue. This is a time to shake hands, to tell people we love them, bless them, that sort of thing. But, but technically, there's a reason for that to be there because we want to make sure there's no unforgiveness on our hearts, there's no sin on our hearts, and as much as possible, nobody has anything against us. We want to make sure we're just as clean as we can possibly be before we begin. What is on page 361 is called the Holy Communion, or what I often call the Eucharist. And if Debbie will come up here, I'm going to show you how that often begins. While everybody else is passing the peace, an acolyte will help the celebrant and she has what's called a lavavo bowl which is um, all these are latin words right for cleanse and she has a lavavo bowl and a lavavo towel and i will clean my hands we're not trying to set up an operating room right this is just symbolism here i'm cleaning my hands and then you can bring the elements up there's a, a psalm, I believe it's Psalm 25, I can't remember exactly what verse, 25, 8 or 9. It talks about, with clean hands and a pure heart, I will work around your table. And to me, that's what that is all about. Making sure that the celebrant is completely clean, ready to go to celebrate. Now you'll notice, if you're reading the small print in the Book of Common Prayer, that Holy Communion or Eucharist begins with someone from the congregation bringing up the elements. And there's a, you notice there's a bow there to receive it. Thank you. And they put those usually on the altar. To me, it's beautiful symbolism because the congregation is saying, and usually the offering comes at the same time and the, and, and the money is set on the offering table. And this beautiful symbolism to say, Lord, here we're coming to you in this sacrament and we're going to give you something and then we're going to expect you to do something miraculous with that 
So the great thanksgiving, that's what Eucharist means. It's a transliteration for the Greek word uh, meaning thanksgiving. The great thanksgiving begins in the middle of 361, and you'll see there's a part for me to say, the celebrant, and then there's parts for you to say. It starts with, the Lord be with you. And also with you. With you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the lift Lord. Them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to, it give, is right to give him thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. It is indeed right and a good and a wonderful and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I want you to write down, don't turn there right now, write down Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. Those give us a great insight to what this is talking about when it says in the next place, therefore we join our voices with angels and with archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. There are, so, there are so many places there in, in Revelation 4 and 5 where it shows us the worship that's going on in heaven. And it shows us what they're saying. And they're saying it all together. They're doing exactly what we're doing tonight. They're doing a liturgy where they, you know, the 24 elders and everybody, they have something to say. And they say it together. So let's say this hymn. And before we do it, let me give you some background. Again, if you got a Bible, want to turn with me, go to Isaiah 6. The prophet Isaiah. Yeah, Debbie brings up a good point, and that is that the let me let me just give you but as we're in the middle of this now, I probably should have done this first, right? So, we've got an altar or a table that is set here. You'll hear some folks in some traditions, they say we're celebrating Mass, we're going to Mass. The word Mass comes from the Latin word, which just simply means table. And so it's often referred to as a communion table. Sometimes it's referred to as a communion altar. And the the cloth that's at the on the very bottom, the very first cloth on the table, is a cloth that indicates the season that we're in. The color of this cloth is white, indicating that we're in, still in the Easter season, and we'll be in the Easter season until Pentecost. And then the color changes, and we go to ordinary time eventually, which is green, and you know, there's different colors. The, the color of the veil is the same, to, again, indicate what season we're in. And I don't know, you can't really see this, but there is a white cloth here on the, that's the, that's at the bottom of, of things. As a matter of fact, of the chalice and the veil, all these things are on top of this white cloth. Later that becomes important because if while I am preparing and serving the host, if there are any crumbs that fall on the cloth, it makes it easy for the altar guild folks after service to fold the cloth inward, to wrap it up, and take it and uh, distribute the consecrated elements outside. So anyway, now, now I'll get to the, the other parts that are on the table, on the altar. We've also got the two candles. You know, when they first started doing this back 2,000 years ago, they call those torches. And they were, they had a very important purpose. You couldn't see anything or read if you didn't have candles in those days. <laughs> they didn't have lights like we had. And so they served a very practical purpose. But over the years, folks began to ascribe meaning to them. Again, this is just part of the richness that we have in our worship. And so they say, well, these candles represent Jesus and how Jesus was all God and Jesus was all man. And so when we look at the altar and see the two torches, the two candles lit, uh, that's a reminder for us that Jesus was all God, yet he was all man. Okay, Isaiah 6 and verse 3. 
And one called out to another and said, this is seraphim in the temple when the temple is filled with the glory of God. One cried out to the other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now go to Matthew 21. So what happens three or four days before Jesus is crucified? He comes into the city of Jerusalem, and as he's coming in, folks greet him as the Messiah arriving. Matthew 21, 9, they were putting their, their coats in front of him. They were putting down palm leaves in front of him. Here he is, is he's riding on the colt of a donkey, a small colt. And what they're saying in verse 9 is, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And so, at this point in the Eucharist, we're just imitating those things. Holy, and as a matter of fact, pray this or, or say this hymn with me. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and became subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature and to live and die as one of us. And he did that to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. The idea behind the Eucharistic prayers is to present in a very condensed form, essentially, the whole story of the Bible, especially the whole gospel story. God makes us, we fall into sin, God sends someone to redeem us. It's not just someone from the sky, it's somebody that comes as a man, as one of us. And then part of the prayer continues he stretched out his arms on the hardwood of the cross and he offered himself in obedience to your will, Father. He offered himself as a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. Now, let me prepare the table and show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove the veil. That's the part that covers everything. Remember, here, turn with me to... 1 Corinthians 11.26 Why are we doing this? Why, why in the world do we do this? Especially every time we get together. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26 Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. He said, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And so remember... That's part of what this whole ceremony is about. So we have a veil that covers everything, sort of like the veil that was used in a Passover meal to keep everything secret. And then on the top of that is something called a pall. Do you know what a pall is? It's a covering for a casket. A, a casket can be called a pall. Now, this one is hard and it's stiff and that's the way they usually are, but that's the symbolism is this is like the burial cloth that would have covered Jesus. On top of that is the paten, which holds the host, the cloth which is called a purificator, which is used to wipe the common cup as folks receive, and then of course the chalice itself. Into the chalice we will pour some wine. And I will add to that a little water, again indicating the water and blood that came out of Jesus' side. I will take the host the loaf in our case. Now I know that's not a very big loaf, right? But for our size group, that's a perfect loaf. I, I just don't like the wafers. I want to use a loaf because Paul said that we 
as Christians, we are one loaf. You know, matter of fact, he even used he even talked about leaven uh, in that. So anyway, so we have the table set now, and we're going to continue the Eucharistic prayer with what's called the words of institution. Now these are, you can find these in, um, in, in the Gospels. You can find these words in uh, Corinthians where essentially they describe what happened on the night before Jesus was crucified. And remember, he was in an upper room, as they called it, he was with his disciples. It was a fairly small group, so it was mostly the apostles and maybe some of the women and, and children of the immediate families. And they were having a Passover meal. He took this time to prepare them. That's the place where Jesus said that most remarkable scripture. He said, I'm going to go away, and because I go away, the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And then he tells them, it's better for you that I go away. Greater works will you do because the Father is sending the Holy Spirit than even I have done. What a wonderful promise. So anyway, he's preparing these guys. And then they're going through the Seder meal. And these are the words that Jesus says that institute this memorial meal that we're celebrating. He says, on the night that Jesus was handed over to suffering and death, he took bread, he blessed it. You'll notice I make the little sign of the cross over the bread. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Those bells are called the Sanctus bells, and... <laughs> Somewhere before the Middle Ages, they started using the bells because they were doing Eucharist in Latin. And nobody knew Latin. A lot of times the celebrant didn't even know what he was saying. He was just repeating Latin words that he had memorized. And so to make sure they understood when something important was happening, they would ring the bells. Okay, I believe it's just a beautiful symbolism to remind us. Yep. Something's going on here. After supper, he took the cup of wine. After he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. When you do this, do it to remember me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. You know where that comes from? It comes from Revelation 4, verse 8. As you can see, most of what we're doing in this liturgy really is just Scripture. Revelation 4 and verse 8 says... It's talking about the living creatures that are full of eyes and six wings, and I can't even imagine what they must be. But this is what they say. It says they, they never cease to say this. So they must say this over and over and over again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, his resurrection, his ascension to you. We offer you these gifts of bread and wine. Now remember, this is the epiclesis. This is the place where many believe that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus. So this is the invocation where I pray, sanctify these, and I make the sign of the cross over them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also so that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. At the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. One of the things that I think is important is that the celebrant has leeway here to pray other things. 
to include other prayers that might go along with this about who we are and what we're doing and what the Lord has been saying to the congregation lately and things like that. But turn with me to John 3, the Gospel of John, the place in the Gospel where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, right, about being born from above. And in verse 14 of John 3, he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I promise you, Nicodemus had no idea what Jesus was talking about. He didn't know that meant that Jesus was going to be crucified. Turn to John 12. John 12, 32. John 12 and verse 32. By the way, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but I'm referring back to my giant-sized Book of Common Prayer here every once in a while for scriptures. I believe that your Book of Common Prayer is like your Bible. You shouldn't be afraid to write in it. Make notes. Write scriptures down. Mark things that you, know, you want to remember or emphasize. John 12, 32. Jesus is talking and he says, And I... If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. And so, at this point, I do the elevation of the body of Jesus and then conclude with, All this we ask in the name of your dear Son, Jesus, by Him, with Him, in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now that last bell and that amen, the early church fathers called the great amen. And as Ignatius said, we all say it heartily. So I love it when I get together with a bunch of priests and other clergy. And boy, when we come to the great amen, they really belt it out. You know, amen. Let us pray as the Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. At this point, we have the fraction where the bread is broken, and usually the celebrant will break the bread, hold it up, and then we, and then the celebrant says, Alleluia, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. And you say, Therefore, let, Therefore, us, keep the let feast. us keep the feast. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where does that come from? Turn to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, and the unleavened of sincerity and truth. So that's where the fraction comes from and that. And I'm going to depart a little bit from exactly what's said here. I want to show you something in the Book of Common Prayer on page, uh, starting at the bottom of 364. Oftentimes you'll hear a celebrant say, he hold the, the cup and the wine, hold it up, and say, the gifts of God for the people of God. And then they will usually add, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, Feed on Him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let me tell you a couple of reasons why we don't say it exactly like that. First of all, we don't say, 
take them in remembrance. We say receive them in remembrance. Remember, this is back to this idea that we don't take communion. We receive communion just like we don't take salvation. We receive it. But the other thing is that even if I were to use this form, I would leave out by faith. You see that in there where it says, feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You know why I would leave that out? I'm not feeding on him by faith. I am feeding on him physically. Understand the difference? But most in the CEC don't say any of that anyway. <laughs> we we take the fractured loaf, hold it in the left hand, hold the cup in our right hand, hold it up, and say, Behold God's love for you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin and the sickness of the world. Some might add, blessed are those who've been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you on the WebEx at home are celebrating with this with us, then this is time for you to fraction the host and get the wine ready. And I'm going to let you receive as we receive here. But before we receive the body and blood of Jesus, I want to just reiterate a couple of scriptures, okay? Go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. John 6. Let's look at verse 54. John 6, 54, Jesus said, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. You'll notice in the Book of Common Prayer, there are a couple of things that someone might say as they're serving the elements, like the body or the blood of Jesus. May that keep you in eternal life. Well, that's where this comes from, from what Jesus said in John 6, 54. In John 6, 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. And so one of the things that some might say is, this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Or this is the cup of salvation, uh, the, the cup of the new covenant. Jesus talked about uh, this being the cup of the new covenant. So there's several things that folks can say as they receive the elements, and all of them come from Scripture. So, typically, if there is an altar party, you know, a, a priest... A, maybe a deacon or two, an acolyte or two, the, maybe the folks that are going to be helping to serve communion, they're the ones that are served first. But the celebrant always serves himself first. I wish I could tell you I knew exactly why. I don't, but that's the way it is. And so this is the body of our Lord broken for me and his blood poured out for me. Purificator, wiping the edge of the cup. Because we use a common cup. And then we serve everyone. Oh, yeah. So Debbie's holding her hands like this. Her left hand makes a cup for her right hand. And then what I do is I place the host in, in the, her open right hand. Uh, she may say something like, Amen. And then she'll... What do you say to me? Yeah, I'll say you, the body of Jesus, broken for you, Amen. or this is the body of Jesus, the bread of heaven, or whatever I happen to say. And then after we serve the host, then we serve the cup. This is the cup of salvation. This is the blood of Jesus, the cup of salvation. The idea is you have a common cup. When they, when they receive, you wipe that part of the cup, rotate the cup, and if you, ever be, if you ever become a Eucharistic minister or server, you'll know that's how you serve the wine. We like serving from a common cup because it's all the common cup of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
So while those on the WebEx are receiving in their homes, we're going to do what I think is supposed to be done at this point, uh, and that is just worship the Lord and bask in His presence. We have literally received the body and blood of Jesus to eternal life. Let's just bask in that presence. Let's soak in Him for a minute. Let's receive healing for body, mind, spirit. Father, send your angels to minister to us as we're here in this place awaiting before you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we just praise you. We worship you. We glorify your holy name. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. It's a great time to just wait before the Lord, wait in His presence, listen. What is the Lord saying to us? Hallelujah. Matter of fact, if anybody hears a word from the Lord for all of us, now's a good time to give it. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Before we pray the final prayer, let me give you another bit of trivia, okay? Notice when I'm standing sometimes with my hands in this position. That's called the Oran's position. Don't ask me exactly what it means. I guess it means prayer, right? And for instance... After folks pray a prayer of repentance, as they receive the declaration of innocence from the celebrant, they will often assume the Oran's position. In other words, I'm receiving this from you. When it comes time for me to say a blessing over folks, it's not uncommon that they will assume the Oran's position. In other words, this is I'm receiving this blessing. The other thing is, it's not uncommon for folks to receive an, either host or blood, body or blood, and then say amen after each one. And then when they've received both, it's not uncommon for them to cross themselves. You don't have to do that. Um, the Roman Catholics will call that blessing themselves, uh, simply making the sign of the cross the most ancient symbol of Christianity that there is. I like doing that. We talked about pre-consecrated host the other day, and I just want to make sure before we leave tonight that you understand what's left of the host here, what we didn't consume tonight. We've, I didn't start with much wine, so we've consumed all the wine. What we didn't consume in the host, we're going to put out in the garden. Okay, We don't throw it in the trash can. We don't throw it down the toilet. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is holy now. I'm going to treat it that way. Let's pray this prayer together at the bottom of page 365. A wonderful prayer to conclude communion. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. At that point, there will be a time for the celebrant to bless the congregation. And then, if, again, if we were in a full service, you'll see on page 366, there are several different suggestions for uh, what a, usually a deacon might say to send people out. So let me do that. Let me bless you real quick and then what I'd like to do is as is our tradition we will conclude the YouTube video but as is our tradition after receiving communion 
we're going to take prayer requests. We're going to pray over each other. We're going to let prophetic words flow between each between us so that God can minister to us. We want to make sure we allow the Lord now that we're in in his presence, in the fullness of his presence, we want to make sure that we can present our petitions and watch him work some miracles. So before we do that, let me bless you. Now, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I bless you. I pray that God will keep you, make his face to shine on you, that he will literally pour out on you every blessing that he has, especially blessings of favor and grace as you go about doing what he has called you to do. Amen. So let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And thanks, be, thanks to be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ is one way to enter. Yeah. Amen. And they were having a Passover meal. He took this time to prepare them. That's the place where Jesus said that most remarkable scripture. He said, I'm going to go away. And because I go away, the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And then he tells them, it's why I did that. Why I didn't do something. How come it, how come it looks so Catholic? Debbie asked the question, how come it looks so Catholic? Well, it looks Catholic and Lutheran and Anglican and Episcopal and Coptic and <laughs> the, the Eucharistic services, even, even the, uh, although they're a little bit more mystical, even the Eastern Orthodox services, uh, uh, Eucharist services are very much like what we're doing here. They include the words of institution. They include the, uh, the consecration of the elements. They include the, the Lord's Prayer and, you know, those sort of things. So.